Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Mr. Uh, Samuel Beeman is a, a Vietnam veteran and a, an author of a book where he tells him experience, experience in Vietnam. So I'm going to turn it right over to him. I'm not going to make it uh, long. Uh, you have an hour, and I don't want to take up any more time. A whole hour? <laughs> so, thank you very much. Oh, but thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sam Beeman, and like he said, I am a proud Vietnam veteran. Uh, I deployed to South Vietnam in December of 1966 with my helicopter squadron, HM 262, and we went into Kiha, which is just outside of July. And he just started my, my slideshow. What you're going to see up here, before I start, what you see right up here, that's my squadron. And it said 50. They flew 50 years with this helicopter, which is unheard of in the United States military. But the, the uh, Marine Corps does a lot of stuff with obsolete stuff. Our helicopter, which you see we were aboard ship here, was put into service in 1964, and that, in 1966, HMM 164 went to Vietnam. And they had a lot of problems. Most of their problems were sand erosion. But on the new ones that came in, we put filters on the engine so you wouldn't get all the sand being ingested into the engine. And that's what 262 did. And that picture right there, that's 262. Their, their call sign is T, Echo Tango. Our call signs was Yankee Tango. Don't pay no attention to those pictures there, those are parties. And any way to get through the night, that's what we did. But this, these uh, pictures will continue to go through. A lot of people think that this aircraft what, is a Chinook, but it's not a Chinook. It's a baby Chinook. It's a CH-46 C-9 made by Boeing Vertol, and it carries, in the States it will carry uh, approximately 20 combat equipped Marines, 15 litters. So, in the Marine Corps, it's not like, it's not like being in the Army. The Army had different choppers for different things. They had dust off, they had Hueys, they did medevacs, they have the Chinook for heavy lifting. The Marine Corps, had very few helicopters, and we did everything. What you see out that window right there, well, that's, he ain't heavy, he's my brother. I just met him last year, for the first time since 1969. He can't lift me over his head no more. <laughs> and that's a picture in New Orleans when I, when I met him. <clears throat> I had the opportunity of flying with some of the finest Marines that you will never hear about. I started my flying in February 1967, and I had a young man come up to me and says, are you a flying crew chief? And I said, yes, I am. Do you have a helicopter? I said, no, I don't. He said, would you like to have one? I said, that's a good idea. He said, well, you can have my helicopter and take it on a flight. And I'm like a kid in a candy store, got a grin over my face, eyes bulging out. I'm going to fly in a helicopter and I'm going to be in combat. So I went and I got my flight suit, and it's totally clean. There's not a grease spot on it. You know, it's brand new. Everybody knew I was a Nicky New guy on, on the flight crew. Now, I'm trying to look professional walking out to the flight line to this helicopter. Well, it didn't work out. Everybody knew that I was the new, new kid. But I pre-flighted the aircraft twice, not once, but twice, to make sure it was okay. So by the time the pilots came out, they said, well, we're going to go on a mission. We're going to Quezon. Well, I had never heard of Quezon. So we're going to go to Quezon. So I got on the aircraft, we're flying up north. And it's, you never think about being shot at. You never think about crashing. You never think about being shot down. You're going to do the mission. What is going to happen when we start getting shot at? Didn't worry me. I'm flying. I'm a helicopter crew chief. We flew up the Quezon. And we were there 
all day were flying to the different places, different LZs where the troops needed food, they needed water. If they needed a medevac, we did that also. We took the wounded back. Well, I thought we were going to fly back to Marble Mountain. We didn't. We stayed at Kazan. As a matter of fact, we stayed at Kazan for two weeks, flying different combat missions. And at the end of the two weeks, I flew back to Marble Mountain, and I was tired. My flight suit was now all greasy and dirty. I hadn't had a shower in a whole week. And we just crawled back to the base. And who did I see? I saw the same guy that gave me his helicopter. And I said, hey, are you a crew chief? He said, yeah. I said, do you have a helicopter? He said, no. You want one? I'm going to give you one. And I gave him his helicopter back. I gave him this screwdriver, his 38, and six bullets that I gave. He gave me all that good stuff. He went on R&R. &R. He went to Bangkok for a week. And he knew that the mission that I was going to go on was going to last more than just a day, but it lasted two weeks. But that was my first mission, but the ice had been broken. And what they were talking about, I looked, this is, a, this is my book, and it's all the truth. I didn't make anything up. And the funny part about it is a story that has never been told. And it's a different perspective of the Vietnam War. Now, I'm not here to tell you whether we should have been in Vietnam or not in Vietnam. I was in Vietnam. I was sent there. I didn't have to go. They sent me. And my mother, religious woman that she was, I said, Mom, I'm going to Vietnam. I'm praying you don't have to go. I said, fine. You keep praying. I became a helicopter, a jet helicopter mechanic. Then I became a crew chief, a qualified aerial gunner. I qualified with the M60 machine gun. We preserved our aircraft, put them aboard ship. Good afternoon. Come on. Put the aircraft aboard ship in North Norfolk, Virginia. And I came home and I said, Mom, this is what we did. I got to, I got to dye my t-shirts and my underwear green. I'm praying you don't have to go. I said, keep on praying, Mom, please. So now I go to church. I tell the people, pray for me, I'm going to Vietnam. I come home, Mom, I'm, I'm praying, I keep on praying. The next week, I'm in Cherry Point, and it's a C-130. The same thing that's parked out there on the flight line. A C-130 sitting there with the four engines turning and burning. I'm going to Vietnam. And I'm going in typical Marine Corps fashion. I'm going in a C-130 with a web seat. So I go over to the phone and I call home. Mom, I'm going to Vietnam. He says, I'm praying you don't have to go. I said, Ma, that prayer didn't work. Come on in. That prayer didn't work. Pray that I get back in one beat. And let me tell you, she did a lot of praying. Because in 19 months of being in Vietnam, flying over 600 combat hours, and flying over 300 combat missions, I never hit one bullet. And this is a big target. I never took one bullet. And the reason that was, was my mother and all of her praying. And I definitely believe that. We, we took off a spot in one on the carrier, which is on the, the very front of the ship. And see, excuse me ladies, but I'm a ball buster. So now, I've got some troops on board and some cargo, and i got a chaplain. So I, I turned to the chaplain and I said, this is going to be a close takeoff, just take a few words. And so, you know, he's looking at me like I'm crazy. So, we lift off and we start out over the front of the ship and we lost power on one of the engines. And the helicopter dropped. And I watch the flight deck go by, I watch anchor go by. There's no way in the world this ship is going to stop. We're going to hit the water and it's going to run us over and we're all going to die. Some Marine jumped up the run. I don't know where he was running to, but I grabbed him and I threw him back in the sea. And just before we hit the water, the engine came back online and we came up. And I blame that on my mother. She did a whole lot of praying. But that's what was killed. 
kept me out of a lot of trouble. Of course, she did got got me into trouble, but she won't she won't accept the blame for that. But all the good stuff she will accept. But uh, what you see, these different pictures, these are A models. And they're gonna retire this helicopter. The end of this month, down at Quantico at the Marine Corps Museum, they're gonna retire this aircraft and they're gonna replace it with the Osprey, which is a B-22, which is this crazy little contraption that lands and takes off like a helicopter but flies like an airplane. They have been trying since 1973 to replace this helicopter. They finally got something that will fly long enough to replace it. But they're going to, on that one there, that's in the presidential helicopter squadron. My, my chopper never shot me that much. It's, 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 uh, it's unbelievable. This is a border carrier in the mountain. As it goes through, you'll see the different jobs that we did. And the, most people don't talk about it. And that's what I mean. It's a job that most people don't even know about. Because these aircraft, and not only a 46, but a 47, a, a Huey, a 53, any helicopter you have, what's called a crew chief, or in some, some cases they're called plane captains or flight engineers. They are responsible for the mechanical operation of the aircraft. They're the ones that fix it, they make sure it's flyable, and then they let the pilots get up their plate. And they let the pilots go ahead and, and fly it. But it's the crew chief that is responsible for the mechanical operation, and not only the mechanical operation, but all the rescue apparatus, the placing of cargo, because cargo is a very sensitive thing with a helicopter, the center of gravity that you have to make, maintain, because it's like balancing on an egg. You'll see pictures like that was taken in Waterbury, that was taken in Maryland. These are individuals that I flew with. He's now a preacher down in Australia. And that's Les Engelhart, he was killed in action by our own artillery. He was shot down by our own artillery on June 11, 1968. That's my cigarette lighter. And I still have that. But if you, you can get a, somewhat of an idea of the individuals that, that made up the squadron. There is no one individual, that's my buddy Louis, he passed away two years ago. He was a crew chief also. But you see, it's all the different people that make up that squadron. And the pilots and the crew chiefs and the gunners are the stars. You know, but you're not, you're not anything without the rest of the squadron. I don't care if it's your mechanic, your, your uh, avionics, your metalsmith, even the chaplain. Even the chaplain kept our head together because when you start dealing with death and destruction, but that's what war is all about. Death and destruction, that's war. War is the dirtiest, nastiest, most evil thing one person can do to another person. And most civilians will never know, and they don't need to know, what war is like. That's why you have these young men and women coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan after multiple tours, and they're talking about PTSD. No, they're never going to be right. 50 years, now it's not for me, it ain't 50 years. It's uh, 48 years for me. I still have, I have PTSD. Once you're there, you're changed forever. Yeah. We wanted, wanted to come home and just be a normal, a normal American. You wanna get off the, you wanna get off the merry-go-round. I wanted to get married. I wanted to have my one and a half children. I wanted to live in the suburb by a white picket fence. <clears throat> When I got out, I went out of the Waterbury Police Department. I spent 28 years in the Waterbury Police Department. I retired as a lieutenant. And my last 12 years, I was in charge of juvenile. But all these pictures that you see, most of these individuals, he lives in uh, Missouri. That's, that's Itchy Brother. I was Biggie Rat. We all had, I, an engine fell on my leg. I said at home, I, I told my mother, it only hurts when I laugh. And she started crying, oh, he's wounded. No, they didn't wound me, and they dropped an engine on me. That's what I'm But these are things that happen that you don't get medals for. But they're the backbone of every squadron that's out there, whether it's fixed wing or it's helicopters. 
they are the backbone. They're the ones that keep everybody straight, everybody's line. That picture there was taken in full body. Uh, the pilots, the one on the end over there, that's, that's uh, he, he's a retired colonel now with a pipe in his mouth. He, I got kicked off flight bay back in 1967. And I'm not getting into all the reasons I got kicked off flight bay, but I was a bad boy. But uh, I figured that I'd be working as a mechanic. Oh no, that didn't happen. Oh wait, our XO, he landed on the post office. That, that he wasn't supposed to be there. He said, he, gets, he got upset, he says, that's what they're gonna remember me by? Yeah, you landed on the post office and you screwed up our mail. That's what happened. But, uh, what happened? Oh, oh. Man, I don't need that. If you, can, if you get it working, all well, yeah, all well and good. Oh, is that what it is? It's saving power? Ha huh, huh. Don't worry about that. But like I said, when I got there, when I got there, we went and we picked up the 2nd Battalion, 3rd Marines from Okinawa. That was in April of 1967. They were the first Marines that were in Vietnam with the M16. And they tried to blame the malfunctions of the M16 on the Marines. That's a bunch of bull. The responsibility goes all the way back here to Hartford, the Colt Manufacturing, where they didn't chrome the, the chamber and they changed the type of gunpowder they were using. They went from ball to stick gunpowder. And they said they didn't have to clean the weapon. The last thing anyone in combat wants is their weapon to jam. Too many Marines were killed because that weapon was no good. It was a hunk of junk. Now you look at the M16, they have a bolt assist on the side where you can hit it. That wasn't on the original M16. When I was on the police department, I was on the SWAT team. They wanted me to carry the M16. If you ever buy a car that's a limit, are you going to buy another car that, of that same make? I don't think so. I told them I would carry the shotgun. I would not carry the M16. I don't trust it. If you don't have faith in your weapon, you're not worth anything. On the choppers, we had a 50 caliber machine gun. <clears throat> we had two of them. I had one on one side, and, I, and uh, my gunner had one on the other side. And I, I, I have to say I was proud, because I was a corporal, and I'm the crew chief, which means I'm, I'm God. I run everything in the back of that chopper. My gunner, who happened to be a, a staff sergeant, he's on, my, he's on the other gun. And we were going to emergency extract. And there's a slider that says emergency extract my ass. There's no such thing as a routine extraction. Because you've got to extract somebody, they're in trouble. Well, we're flying into the valley. And I start hearing pop, 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 pop. I look out my window, I don't see nothing. I look out the left side, and it looked like a cameraman's convention. It was all muffle flashing on the side of the mountain. They're shooting at me. <clears throat> and my gunner is on the gun looking. He froze. He froze on the gun. And I did a little motivation. I just turned, and I put my foot up his behind. And he started shooting. We went into the valley. We picked up the recon team. There was a couple of wounded that were there. We brought them out. And once we got back to the base, he turned to me and says, I'm going to write you up. I said, for what? You struck the staff NCO. Well, you see, while Mullins were in the air, I'm the boss. We get back to the base, he's the boss. I said, if you write me up, I'm going to let everybody know that you froze on the gun. Well, he never wrote me up. I never made sergeant, but I but he never he never wrote me up. But then little things started happening. Where like I said, I got kicked off like they a couple times. But that's all right. But that colonel put me back on flight day. He put me back on flight day. See these things run off too entirely too fast. But uh, when he put me back on flight day, he suddenly disappeared. 
they made him a forward air controller in Kaysai for the 77 day siege. He was awarded the Silver Star. And five years ago, sadly to say, Colonel Holden passed away from Agent Orange that he got at Kaysai. But I will believe to my dying day, they sent him there because he put me back on my face. He was originally from Cheshire, Connecticut. And when I had him and I had Don Clark, he was from Short Beach. Short Beach is just outside of New Haven. Three of us on, the, on that chopper were from Connecticut. And I renamed my chopper the Connecticut Yankees for that flight. And we, we did our job. It was one of the nicest flights we ever had, yo. The missions that we flew. That one right there, that was at the Marine Corps Ball. The Marine Corps paid for me to go to California. The last time they paid for me to go to California, they, they didn't stop at California, they kept on going. I kept on going to Hawaii. Hawaii, Wake, to Guam, and uh, the Philippines, and then to Vietnam. So I was a little leery about going there. But I, I did. I, they, they treated me very, very nicely. But uh, like, like I said, that 50, that 5 0 is made up of all helicopters. I can, I can follow behind this very easy. My buddy in Chicago made the cover for my book and also the other one. That's me talking to, uh, well, he he's dead too. He, he died in a uh, firework accident. Yeah, that's kind of scary. I look at these pictures, a lot of people aren't with us no more. You know, 50 years it took, took this state and based, based this nation to say thank you to us. Because, of re the, because what, what we received when we came back wasn't the nicest reception that you can find. And the, the Vietnam veteran has changed things, not only for us, but for the Korean War veterans, and for the ones from Desert Storm, Iraqi freedom, and what's going on in Afghanistan, all of it. Because we vowed that the treatment that we got would not be the same treatment that the vets are coming back. If you don't like the message, you don't shoot the mailman. You change things. But we support all our young men and women that are doing multiple deployments. We support them in everything that they do. Because we know what they're going through. And they don't have to say anything, but we welcome them with open arms. It didn't happen with us. The veterans organization didn't believe that we were in combat. They were through the police action. And they said the same thing about those from Korea. Anybody that's shooting at me, I call it a war. And I don't care if it's our people shooting at us or, their, or the enemy shooting at us. You're just as dead as you get hit by it. And these are things that you learn to live with. And it's, it's, it's very difficult for anybody to spend time in the military to turn around and try and be, quote, normal when you come back here. Because you've seen too much, you've done too much, you had too much fun at some point in time. And we did that too. You party hard because let me tell you something. You never know whether or not you're going to be around tomorrow. So you live today as if it was your last day. And they're doing that overseas right now. They're protecting your freedom and my freedom of what they're doing. And they're paying a price for it. With each deployment, they're a little part of their... Humanity is being dug away. Most people don't even think about it. I think about it because I know what they're going through. I wanted to read something out of this book. Uh, you're going to leave me a little bit of time to say, if anybody's got any questions, I'll be happy to deal with that. Actually, I want to do a, re a revised book because there's some things that should have been in here that I didn't think about. But I, I wrote this book. 35 years after being there. Now I've got to try and remember stuff. And I tried to remember putting it in a chronological order where it made sense. And I think I accomplished that because the best, the, uh, the best review that I've gotten was by the people that I served with. And I've sent them copies of the book and it, and it you know, if I was trying to blow smoke at them, it's a totally different story. Didn't do that. I told them, I told the story exactly the way it was. We did not go to bed until the chopper was finished because they needed the aircraft the next day. If we had a, a strike to go out, 
we made sure there was enough aircraft available to do what they had to do because we were the only lifeline for that guy in the infantry that was out there in the field. We're the only link that they had getting back to civilization. I had, on the Princeton, we had two guys from Waterbury, Connecticut on there. They sat there for three days because we were, I think the captain of the ship was riding around us in a fog bank, and he didn't want to get out of the fog bank. But to get them to the, the name so they could get home. You don't know where you're going to run into people. In, in Fubai, I ran into Bobby Brown. Uh, uh, he just passed away. He was a famous basketball player in, in Waterbury. And I looked up, Bobby Brown. He had a chance of being uh, uh, a pro, pro, professional basketball player. But we're talking about the mid-60s, where you didn't have Gino Auriemma or, or, or Calhoun. And you didn't have the exposure for the University of Connecticut. But he, could, he didn't get picked up. He became a, di a division manager at McDonald's. So you don't know where your life is going to take. And he did very, he did very well with what he did do. But there's that, that routine extract. There's no such thing. You put him out there in the field. This is the first, that's, that is the first reunion we had in Washington, D.C. And you know what the wives and girlfriends said? That reunion was needed because now they understood what we were going through. And everything was fine until they flew a 46 into the hotel. And when I say they flew it in the hotel, they, they weren't 100 feet into the parking lot. They landed it right there and didn't tell nobody was coming. There was no fire department, no police department, nothing. But we had a general in, in the uh, squadron. He ordered it up. And when it landed and shut down, all you could smell was the, the jet fuel. And there was not a dry eye in the place. Because just smelling the jet fuel took everybody right back to Vietnam. And we thought about, we had just left the wall, my first time going down to the wall. And I, there's 23 names on that wall from HMM 164. I did not know the first three, and I didn't know the last three. The ones in the middle died while I was there. You lose one whole chopper, you lose four people. Pilot, co-pilot, crew chief, and gunner. We lost too many of them. My bunkie slept right next to me, Randy Little. July 3rd, 1968, he went out flying. He got shot down by an RPG. He didn't come back. You know, there's different, you can look at these pictures. This one here is the helicopter valley. The, the helicopter at the bottom was shot down. Nobody talks about this. As I said, they're the backbone of every branch of the service. The Army has more helicopters than the Marine, they have more aircraft than the Marine Corps, the Navy, and the Air Force combined. They can afford to lose some. We couldn't afford to lose anything. We used to fly out to the field. You would have a chopper that would crash we go out and we'd be like a bunch of termites going across it, taking every piece of equipment off of there that we could use and bring it back. And then we use it. Of course, the FAA didn't know what we were doing. Of course, they weren't over there checking either. But that's what we had to do. We were short with, with uh, oil seals around the rotor blades. We took a rag. This ain't in the book either. We took a rag and did it in hydraulic fluid, put it around of the rotor blade to the knife, stuck it in there. And when you land in a couple of sandy zones, the sand would make a perfect seal around there. And it was sealed, it was sealing oil in the rotor head. Now I'll tell you something else. Not one pilot ever found it. Because they don't know what to look for. They just get in, they push the button, they fly. All well and good. But that that's what we did. We landed out of the side of the helicopter is spitting hydraulic fluid. He says, what's that? I said, oh, I just overfilled the hydraulic system. He goes and finds out about the mission while he's going out filling the whole system back up with, with hydraulic fluid. And he comes back out. We go, we go flying. No problem. What does he know? He's sitting up there fat, dumb, and happy. I'm the one worried about everything in the back. But that's what we do. You're a crew. You work together. And you know, that one there sitting on top of a mountain. 
He missed the landing zone. Yeah. That's a pilot's fault, man. <laughs> but see, like I said, you know, they're all greasy and dirty. We did the best we could with what we had. Most of these shots here are taking them and then marble mount. Or like here, that's aboard the aircraft here. We aboard the Princeton, the Triple Eight, and the Valley Forge. They're all LPHs, which is called landing platform helicopters. And they're smaller than your big attack aircraft carriers with your CVAs when you start talking about the independent uh, enterprise, the Ranger, the Eisenhower, the nuclear powered ones. Uh, but you can do a lot from a helicopter, aircraft carrier. Like I said, that's from HMX-1. HMX-1 is a presidential helicopter squadron and is stationed in Quantico, Virginia. And they I guess they're trying to get rid of the president because they had some 46s on there. They got they got S60s and they got uh, Sikorsky does all the other ones, but they, they do let the president fly. They, the first president to fly in one of those was Bill Clinton, and he survived that. So hey, they think we didn't lose him. We ain't gonna lose nobody else. So we'll keep on trying. But uh, I got to tell you a little something. Yes. If anybody got any questions, please raise your hand. I'll do the best I can to try to answer it. Like I said, I was the, the crew chief, and on one mission, I had a general. I had a brigadier general flying with me with some of his staff. And uh, my wingman had a problem. He said, we got to land, so we started following him down. And the pilot said, well, Sam, we got a problem. And I said, oh, no, every time he said that, we really have a problem. And, and I had a chip detector light. So now I left my machine gun, and I started troubleshooting the aircraft. And I ran to the back, and I checked that, and that was okay. I ran to the front. Well, I'm running to the front. I look over. The general has gotten up out of his seat. Now, he had a captain and a lieutenant with him. The general got up out of his seat, and he's on my machine gun. Well, I ain't got time to talk to him. You just sit on the machine gun. I went and I checked the forward transmission. And I found that the problem was a broken wire. So I'm playing with the pilot. I said, you want the light on, you want it off, you want it on, you want it off. So I fix it. In the meantime, the general is still on my gun. And we landed. Now I'm a corporal, E-4. I am not going to tell a brigadier general what to do, but I could because I'm the crew chief. So now when I finish fixing the problem, I turn to the general and he looks at me. And he smiled and he nodded his head. And I smiled at him and I nodded my head. He went back to his seat and I went back to my machine gun. That that smile, that was the respect. It wasn't general to corporal, it was marine to marine. He was taking over my job while I was doing my job of troubleshooting that helicopter. And when we got, you know, we went up, we completed the mission, everything else. But that, that's the kind of respect that you get as being a crew chief. And it, it's, to this day, I get chills just thinking about it. If you are on an airplane, on a regular civilian airplane, the per your, your stewardess or your flight attendant is the person in charge of that cabin. Of all your emergency procedures, yeah, I'm going to tell you how to put your seatbelt on. I didn't have no oxygen mask or anything like that. But I'm going to tell you what to do in case of an emergency. And you're supposed to listen to them. I'm not, how can I tell a general that? It was very easy without the crew chief. And you know, like I got that it was the most, re most responsible, yeah, you saw the one where I was pressing, huh? That was the most responsible job that I have ever had. I'm a licensed private pilot. I spent 28 years on the Waterbury Police Department. The most responsible job that I ever had was being 19 years old, being in charge of a helicopter, a million dollar helicopter. And like I said, they haven't made one of these helicopters since 1973. So if you find a 46 that is under 50 years old, it's a counterfeit. It's a counterfeit. But they, they finally worked all the bugs out of it. What happened was, oh, there are a bunch of pilots. We don't pay, no, pay them no mind. We just let them, like I said, we just let them sit up in front and, and have fun. But what, oh, back, back to the CO. That, 
that was the post office in Da Nang. That's where that was. And when, when I had the the honor of being the guest speaker at HMM 164 in California for the Marine Corps Ball, he was there. And I and I I, I said, Colonel Nelson. And then when that came up, he said, Oh no, you showed that too. For his whole military career, that's what he's known for, is crashing into the post office in, in the name. But that, this will give you some kind of an idea of what we did. We did a little bit of everything. Whether it was medevac, resupply, troop movement. That was my chopper. That was my chopper, Tina's toy. That was Yankee Tango 3. And when that went to overhaul, I got Yankee Tango 14. The last ones that died in Vietnam at the evacuation of the embassy in Saigon, the chopper crashed off the side of the carrier. It was my chopper, Yankee Tango 14. And that was in 1975, but I was on the Waterbury Police Department then, so I had other things to worry about. But those, those were the last two people to die in the Vietnam War was my, my chopper. That's a real, well, that's a young kid there. I try to call him off as, as my son, but I'm better looking than my son, so. <laughs> I'm doing the best I can with what I got. The things that we did do, I am so, I'm humble, really. I'm honored to have served with a bunch of proud Americans that you will never hear about. They are from all over this country. They're from California. You'll see pictures of with me and civilian clothes and different individuals. Like I said, John Wickline is in. He's a he's a minister in uh, Australia. You got Mike Bott. He's in he's in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. He uh, retired from Delta Airlines. You have Joe Jacobs. He's retired a retired airline pilot. You got individuals you would never you would never come across, and it's a it's a part of my life I, I am proud of. I'm proud to tell anybody that I was a Vietnam veteran. I'm proud to say that I was a Marine, even though I might not have been the best Marine. I was I was a proud Marine because I still can't swim. I got pull, I got pulled out of the pool twice in boot camp, but you have to be at least a second class swimmer. Be a member of a flight crew. So when I went to Memphis to school, they allowed me to try to requalify, and I requalified as a second-class swimmer. I, they let me do the backstroke, and I cheated to get, to get that done too. But I got it done. And my father was always he was always mad that he, he had fought in the Battle of the Bulge, and he said, "Oh, big-time Marine, and yeah, big-time Marine." You think you're bad, and yeah, I'm bad. I said, you can't get down and give me 20 push-ups. Now, my father was 41 years old. You know, I'm 18, and he, he dropped down in the kitchen floor. My mother looked in a state of shock. Her mouth dropped open. My father did 20 push-ups. Now, I could have done a, a lot more, but you know what that said? You don't beat your father, and I left it at that. And, they, and he, he used to used to grind, grind me a little bit. Big time Marine. And come, after he passed away, I got his high school yearbook. And at the bottom of his picture, now you have to understand this, the Marine Corps was segregated. They, when the Marine Corps was first founded, back in 1775, they had two battalions of Marines. And they had 24 black Marines. In 1793, now we're talking about after the Revolutionary War, the Secretary of War told the Commandant of the Marine Corps, you will not recruit any black, Indian, or mulatto into the Marine Corps. And it stayed that way until June 1st, 1942. There are no black Marines in, in the Civil War. There are no black Marines in the Spanish-American War. Or World War I. My father, at the bottom of his picture, it says, I want to be a Marine. He graduated from high school in June of 1942. 
of which was the first graduating class after the day of infamy, after December 7, 1941. They allowed blacks to join the Marine Corps June 1, 1942, and they were known as the Moffett Point Marines. But they fought the way they were trained to fight. They were, they were trained to fight as Marines. They served in the Pacific. They were on Iwo Jima. They were at the, the they were on the second and third wave to go in on Iwo Jima. It, my father. It also says on the bottom of this picture. Now you got to take this in the context of. June of 1942. He said he wanted to be president of the United States. And these are some brave words from a black man in 1942 when there were very few black politicians and sure enough there was no black president. But he said he wanted to be a Marine. And he wanted to be president of the United States. He dared to dream. He never made it to be, um, being a Marine. I took care of that. He never made it to President of the United States. Well, my brother got involved in politics, and he became a state legislator. And he retired out of Hartford after 20 years as a state legislator. My father never saw that because he passed away in 1980. But he laid the, he laid the groundwork for us. Now, everything that I wanted to do, he criticized me. I don't know why you want to be a Marine. I said, you taught me to be the best. That's what I want to be. I don't know why you want to be a cop. Well, the law says I got to supply, I got to provide for my wife and children. I'm going to try being a cop. He says, well, I don't know why you want to fly an airplane. Well, you told me I could do anything that I wanted to do, and every time I try to do it, you criticize me. Well, he never gave us compliments. My father never gave us a copy. My brother became the director of community development for the city of Waterbury. My father walked into his office and looked around. You could have got a bigger desk and turned around and walked out. That's a compliment from my father. I go out of the police department. Ah, oh, you big time cop now. No, I'm just doing a job. No, you're nothing but a cop. You're flat, but that's it. But after he died, people come up, your father was so proud of his four boys. We, that he bragged about us to them, but he said we could always do better. And that's what we did. We're coming out of the north end of Waterbury. I'm a retired police lieutenant. My brother Greg is a retired mechanical engineer. My brother Reggie. Well, he's a retired politician now. He can't be perfect, you know. We got to deal with him. And my youngest brother, he's a retired computer supervisor. My mother didn't know what the hell he did. And she said, "Okay, son, I don't know what you do, but I'm proud of you anyway." So that's the way it was. And and we got the support from the family. But you see, this is all my father. This book, this is this is all my father. You know, and and. Sometimes you miss that little pat on the back. My father never saw me make detective because he died two months before I, two weeks before I made detective. He didn't see me make sergeant. He didn't see me make lieutenant. Uh, he didn't see. Yeah, I, I got my when I got my private pilot license. I said, Dad, we he owned a package store. I said, I'm coming down East Farm Street and I'm coming down low. Make sure the traffic lights on green. So I come, I come down the street. I find it. This is a day after I solo, but with all my flight time that I had in the Marine Corps, I knew what the hell I was doing. So I, you can fly VFR, which is visual flight rules, or IFR, which is instrument fl flight rules. Or IFR also means I follow roads. So I took off and I followed Route Four, Route Sixty Nine. And I went over, I found Long Hill Road, and I found East Farm Street. And I came down there at 100 feet off the ground. Definitely in violation, but hey, I'm doing it. Illegal! Hey, I was a cop. Who's going to lock me up? So, you know, I, 
I go down, he's far free. The guy goes running into the into the package store. Mr. Beeman, Mr. Beeman, there's an airplane out there flying low. That's only my stupid ass son. That's what he said. <laughs> so I do a 360 and I come back around. So now he can come out. He comes out. And he's waving a towel at me. And I'm waving back at him and I fly back to the airport. That's before we had cell phones and all this. I fly back to the airport. I come back and I said, Dad, I saw you out there. You were, waving, you were waving a towel at me. I was saying, get away from the store, idiot. Get away from the store. <laughs> Another compliment, you know. <laughs> but these are, these are things that makes my personality, you know. And, and that was in the book here. Uh, it took me a while to do this. Uh, I wrote it, it came out in 2007, and it took me almost three years of trying to remember things that I thought was relevant, where a civilian could understand it. I had to rewrite it a couple times because I had my cousin read it. He said, what are you talking about here? What are you talking about there? I had to break it down so everybody could understand it. Where the first time I got a chance to fly, I cussed out the co-pilot. Now, I told you I was bad, but I'm laying in the back, and we're trying to pick up a load off a, off a rock pile. Now, if anybody knows about Vietnam, the rock pile is a 700-foot peak, and it comes right up to the top, and you have a loading platform on there. And the wind is blowing us around, and I, I'm laying back down to left, right, up, down, forward, back, and the wind is blowing us all over the place. I said, damn it, hold this thing steady. And the captain, who the, the, the person in charge, the, he was the rank of captain, he said, what's the matter? I said, that idiot can't hold it steady. Now, I didn't mean to call the lieutenant an idiot, but I did. So now, the pilot brings it around, puts it in a hover, we hook up the external load. Now, anybody knows anything about aircraft, you pick the load up, and you let the engine build up the, the horsepower, and you go off. Well, this co-pilot starts dragging the load off of the loading platform. And I'm yelling, up, up, pick it up. And when the load swung off, the aircraft drooped. And when it drooped, I saw the ground come up like this. And I made a mistake. I pushed my push to talk button, and I said, ah! And the pilot came up out of his seat like this. He said, what's the matter? I said, that idiot almost killed us. So now we bring the load back, drop it off. The pilot says, well, we're going to check out the number two engine. I said, OK, I'll go get the co-pilot. He says, no, you're going to ride left seat. Hey, I never sat up front. Why not sit up front? I strapped myself in. We went out and checked out the engine. There was nothing wrong with it. He sets the helicopter down. He says, pick it up. Oh, I haven't seen you do this a hundred times. Yeah, you put the weight off the nose wheel, you get a little power, and you're off the ground. Well, it's like driving with power steering. You don't know how much to turn the wheel. And I didn't know how much power to pull in. So I said, it's not coming off the ground. And you know what I see in my mind? Levers and actuators and cables, and they're all moving, changing the pitch on the plate, but it's not coming up off the ground. He takes it, brings it up into a hover, and says, you got it. I said, I got it. How am I doing? He said, not bad, except you're going like this. What I'm doing, I'm, I'm overcorrecting. So he stops it. You got it? I said, I got it. I was in a nose down attitude. This time he said, pull back on the stick. I pulled back on the stick. Backwards we went. He stopped it. He says, head for the river. I said, oh, this is easy. The river's on the left. So a little bit of power. Left side, a little left rudder. And we're heading for the river. He said, what else do they go ahead? I said, 2,500 feet. He said, what else did you start out at? I said, 500 feet. What happened was I pulled in too much power. It was like being in an elevator. And I was going up like this. So he brought it back down and we sat, we, we landed. And he got out of this. You know, actually it was a flying lesson for me. I didn't realize, but that's what it was. He says, these helicopters aren't that easy to fly. I said, I know they're not. He said, don't you think you owe the co-pilot an apology? Because everybody in the whole crew heard me call him an idiot. So I said, no. He said, why not? I said, he's supposed to know how to fly it. I just fixed it. And everybody laughed. He never said nothing to worry about it. 
never said another word. That was my first opportunity to be behind the stick of one of those. But you learn to fix them. I, I'm not trying to learn to fight. I have my responsibility. He has his responsibility. My responsibility is all, everything in the back. And if they're not doing the right thing in the, in the, in the cockpit, I tell them that too. I could do that, but you know, you got to use a little bit of tact when you do that. You just don't start yelling at officers. You know, I had a, I had a major run on board. We dropped, we, 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 we dented one of his drones. You know, you got these little drones now, but this is a big drone. What they used to do is they used to take the Neptune bomb and they would take these uh, drones and send them over to North Vietnam. They would take pictures and they would come back. And then when they ran out of fuel, the parachute would come out. They'd get a recovery team and we'd go pick it up and we'd bring it back to the name. Well, we brought it back and we set it down and it, we set it down real hard. And the major came running inside, yelling and screaming at me. Why are you screaming at me? I'm not flying the darn thing. I said, go take it up with the, with the pilot. So he runs up there, and he walks right into a lieutenant colonel. Needless to say, he came back with his tail between his legs, and he didn't say a word. But you got, you got a lot of officers that, that they don't give you the respect of what you're doing. I had a captain came up to the, the external phone and start yelling at my lieutenant colonel. When you come back here the next time, I want my chief, you make sure you bring it. And so Lieutenant Colonel says, Sam, I said, yes, sir. He said, you tell that idiot, he's yelling at a Lieutenant Colonel. I said, but sir, I'm a corporal. He says, I'm a Lieutenant Colonel. Slap that idiot up beside the head and, and tell him. I leaned out the cabin door and I slapped him up beside the head. And you're yelling at a lieutenant colonel. I don't know where that captain went, but I never saw him again. <laughs> he just disappeared. <laughs> but these are these are stories you're not going to hear. You're not going to hear these stories on the History Channel. These are things that actually happen. Some are funny, you know, and and, and some some are uh, a little sad. But there's more good. We had more good times. Those are reunions in, in Florida we had. But uh, we had more good times than we had bad times. Each time we lost someone, that's one thing the military doesn't teach you. They will teach you how to fight. They will teach you how to survive. They do not teach you how to grieve. They don't teach you how to grieve for your buddy that you just lost. What you have to do, you have to continue doing your job. You don't have time to stop the grief. And when you have a time to stop and grieve, that's when you go to the chapel. Or you wind up going to the chapel, and they will have a memorial service for that individual. In January 1967, we lost C.I. Henry, the HMM 262. He got shot in the eye. He left, his chopper came back, they brought him over to the aid station where he died. The chopper came back, of course there's some bandages and gauze. The chopper's there, his rack is there, his smiling face is gone forever. I trained with him in the States, deployed to Vietnam with him, and now CI is gone. How am I supposed to act? I got a job to do. I've got to go right back out there and I've got to get that helicopter ready to fly. That's my job. Because there are people out in the field that are depending on that job. And it's my responsibility to make sure that it's flight worthy to get there. Is there any questions? And see, I'll keep you here all day. You know? <laughs> There's so many different stories I can tell you. But like I said, I only put a few in, in the book. I have a few copies that are here. I'm at the desk over by the entrance gate, going out onto the flight line. If anybody's interested, I'd be happy to sell you book. I'm only charging twenty, twenty dollars. If they want me to sell them for twenty-five, but I, I make it a twenty, twenty percent discount, veterans discount, and I sell them for twenty. But if there's any questions, I'd be glad to answer.